I found your account of, for example, the relationship between like peasant land holdings in India in the 1850s is very interesting. And but like and in the last part of your talk, I, I didn't get the time to go back into what you saw was the modality of like, that exchange today in India between, for example, mining corporations in like places like you know, in Andhra and in Basketball. And I was wondering whether you saw a sort of a structural similarity between the way that that exchange occurred in the 1850s and how you sit, and the current ways of exchange. Because I know that, that as you know very much, there's a, a very well, there's a current debate about mode production in India today. So I was wondering whether you could speak to that. Um, you spoke about the switch from uh, productive accumulation into financial speculation as a characteristic of a crisis of overaccumulation in, in the productive uh, sector. And so we, we can take this back to John Stuart Mill and so on. Um, you said, uh, but I, th I think you said, um, that in the 1980s and 1990s, this was able, this switch was able to restore the rate of profit for, I suppose, for capital as a whole. Now, I wonder what your view is on. <laughs> on what the source of profit is in the uh, circuit of speculation in fictitious capital, the buying and selling of fictitious capital, and the profits that are made there. Because it would appear on the face of it that no value is being created there. And therefore, that, it, that although uh, merchant banks and so on can accumulate profit for themselves, it is not actually creating any surplus value, and it's not, uh, and therefore it can't um, increase the uh, profitability of capital as a whole. The only way that I could, or just to add a little sort of footnote to that question, the only way that I can see of uh, this, uh, so to speak, not being a zero sum, because what it appears to be is a sort of zero sum between capitalists uh, selling these bits of fictitious capital bits of paper back and forwards, and uh, one can only make a profit out of the loss of another. Um, however, there is, a, there is a whole sector of, final, of, of uh, money capital, namely the pension funds and the financial institutions, which appear to have been the losers, the systematic losers. And in that sense, you could say that while well, perhaps profit is being made in, a, in, a, in some sort of real sense in, the, uh, in these financial transactions, by basically stealing from the pension funds and insurance policies of the working class. So, I don't know, <laughs> but I'm, I'm mystified by that. <laughs> Anyone else want to come in on this? I'm Tony Norfield, I'm, I'm sorry. So I, I think, just coming back on that previous question, that um, the source of financial profits well, one of the great things about financial profits is you really don't care. Um, and it comes from everywhere, especially if you run the global financial system from London, New York, or wherever. And I would think that um, an important point is that the extra source of the profits um, gained by US banks, British banks, and a bunch of other banks essentially is a cut from surplus value produced elsewhere but then it's a complicated process exactly where from. But largely, it would have come from broad exploitation in the world economy, and in particular, um, in the situation since uh, the 1980s in particular, when you, when you had um, you know, the integration of China and other countries of Eastern Europe into the, the global capitalist system. So all, all of these factors have helped um, produce certain aspects which 
gave a character to the uh, financial dimension of, uh, of the crisis. But the point, I think, is that this helped to, the accumulation process to continue, but when the bubble burst, it looked like a financial crisis, but it wasn't a financial crisis. It's a consequence of you know, accumulating the problems of capital accumulation, essentially. So now we have a situation of huge debts, which have been shuffled between private debtors onto state debtors, and hence, of course, it's now looking like a, a public sector debt crisis. But it's a reflection of you know, much bigger scale problems in, in the global economy. I, I would disagree with um, some comments Jarvis made that, at the end of his presentation on I uh, think citing Alphard uh, talking about CDS as a means of speculating to attack the Eurozone because the CDS was just a, a price in the financial markets that made it absolutely clear what was going on. It's reflecting a reality, not really being an independent driver of the problem. So I, I think it's, it's important not to see, although there's manipulation of financial markets, so I'll be the first to uh, agree with that. I think the, the kinds of extreme price moves that have been going on are a reflection of an underlying problem, uh, in particular for Greece, but certainly for many other countries, reflecting a, a very substantial um, crisis in, in the world economy. And the, the point, I think, which is really quite important is to try to pin down the connections between an underlying problem of uh, capitalist profitability and the, the problems arising from that and the financial form that it takes. Otherwise, if you focus, I'm not saying you're doing this, but many people do focus on the financial form and then talk about regulation of the banks and everything will be sorted <coughs> out and, and it could, um, we could reform the system and we could get a solution. Uh. I'd like to come back to the first part of your presentation uh, uh, about uh, the production of opium. You said that labor, in that case, subsumes the means of production. Uh, uh, the, in the first part, uh, the part about the opium, uh, production of opium, and, um, the, the speaker said that the labor subsumes the means of production. And in order to represent this assumption, that the formula in a, in a, in a, in a uh, Marx capital should be modified. Now, this formula, this generalization, will be another generalization. So, not a universal generalization. Uh, uh, what does it mean? Are you suggesting that we need a family of generalization or the impossibility to generalize on this case? <coughs> what I'm saying is that if we, if we decide that transactions in jute, indigo, cotton, sugar, opium, you know, a whole set of colonial trades and markets uh, embody a circulation of capital and that this is not simple circulation in, you know, in, the, in, the, in the sense that Marx understood it. It's not just a set of transactions between independent producers and mm -hmm. buyers and so on. If we accept that, all I'm saying is that in addition to the figure of the circuit of money capital that you have in volume two, you would have another a slightly modified figure to explain this form of circulation, the, the circulation of capital. I don't know if there's something to write with, but um, it's yeah. anything here? It doesn't seem to be. It's M into C, and then the C in volume two goes up to LP, labor power, and yeah. down to means of production. All I'm saying is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Technology. <laughs> so you have M C, okay. <laughs> M C. And then in Marx it goes up. It goes like this, okay? Labor power and means of production. Okay? That's the figure of the circuit of money capital in volume two. Mm -hmm. I'm certainly not suggesting a revision of that for volume two, for the kind of industrial capitalism that Marx is talking about. I'm saying if you want to try and understand circulation of capital in the colonial trades, okay, you have to get rid of this. 
Because capital isn't buying means of production. It isn't buying bent peasant means of production. So you have to get rid of this. Okay? And what is... It's a subsumption of labor power into capital, all right? But that labor power comes with land. It comes with uh, all the other means of production of a peasant family household. That's all I mean. It comes with that, right? So it's not as if we have capital buying means of production. Yeah, you, you look mystified, but... <laughs> oh, yeah. But since you are retreating, you are saying something incredibly important, and then you are uh, in some way diminishing the effect, saying no. that this is a subset. Uh, it's a subset of uh, you, uh, you said that like, it's a colonial subset. I'm saying that the, generalization. Means of, the means of production mm. of the peasant household <coughs> are subsumed into the labor power, which is subsumed into capital. Mm -hmm. yeah? yeah? I mean... It, seems fairly straightforward to me. And that is how we have to, that's how you have to write the structure, the circuit, the figure of the circuit of money capital for these colonial trades. Yeah? It's great, in my view. Well, it seems that you are retreating from the cons consequences. Uh, oh, but what are the consequences? I'm retreating from something I, well, I haven't understood the implications in that case, but I'm certainly not suggesting this is an alternative to what you find in volume two. I'm saying if you were to extend that kind of thinking, to the colonial world, this is how the circuit of money capital would look. Because capital isn't buying means of production in the countryside. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, it's using those means of production through peasant labor power. Mm -hmm. Yeah? I, I found this talk absolutely brilliant. And I agree generally with the, the point you're making about the relationship between the decline and profitability in the productive sector and the growth of finance, speculation, etc. I'm wondering if you could comment on the, fact, on the sort of conundrum you, you did. There's a little bit of a conundrum. You're acknowledging that Sheik and others, for example, David McNally, are correct. There was a neoliberal boom from 1982 to 2007, which I agree with. But you also see a growth of the financial sector. Now, McNally and Sheik have made arguments that, in fact, the growth of the financial sector <coughs> facilitate the continued rise in profitability in the real sector by, on the one hand, derivatives are a way of dealing with currency fluctuations to ensure that as capital is exported and profits are brought back, those profits don't disappear through currency manipulation. Shake and some of his students have argued that the growth of junk bonds, etc., was all part of a process which continued in a controlled way, the devalorization of inefficient capitals that begin in the 81-82 recession. That it allows for a process by, an ongoing process by which less profitable firms, etc., are basically destroyed and the bottom of the capital stock is, rises. In addition, Sheik has had produced statistical studies which show that at least the price of securities are not arbitrary, that they are very much directly tied to the overall level of profitability, and that the rate of profit in the financial sector equalizes with the rates of profitability throughout the economy. It, equalize, it, it has much sharper and more frequent fluctuations because the capital stock is lower, but in that there's no fixed, there's little or no fixed capital, but it does equalize with the profit with the rate of profit generally. So I'm wondering if you could sort of reflect a little bit on the sort of the the continued growth of the financial sector and of <coughs> to be in many populist versions the casino economy in a period of sustained growth of profitability in the real economy. Name? Charlie Post. Us. Um, to, to defend uh, Charity's orthodoxy. I just wanted to defend Charity's orthodoxy about the, 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 the peasants being subsumed under, under capital. I mean, Marx discusses this I mean, at, at several points in Capital it, itself, and in uh, the 1861-63 manuscript where he's discussing the formal and real subsumption of labour under capital, he says that they're also transitional forms in which peasants who own the means of production are subsumed under capital. And it seems to me that this is a, 
Yeah, Jairus is talking about the case of that. I'm slightly puzzled because the last time I heard Jairus speak a few months ago in London, he said that Marx was wrong about that. But um, you know, it don't, I, I don't see why it's such an it's such an um, uh, such a problematic case. Um, and I think it, I think um, including those kinds of cases widens our understanding of how capitalism functioned as a world system in the 19th century and in certain ways continues to do so. Over there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, no, I, I was Pete Green's money. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to go back to that. I was the one who shouted at cotton um, when you posed the question of was there what manufacturing industry was there in Britain in the nineteenth century that was provided you know, the basis for the profitability of uh, British capital. And I do want to, in a sense, go back to that, because I'm a bit, I like your account on the opium trade. Actually, I think you should have done the whole talk on the opium trade, to be honest. Mm. Um, yeah. the whole, you know, really. Um, and, it, and all the ramifications of that in terms of the financial uh, profits and where they were going in the city and so forth. Because clearly there is a story to be told that hasn't really been told, at least not in recent times. But I do think it's important, if you're going to get a broader sense of where British capitalism was at, if I'm, I mean, I wish I had the figures, but the, the significance of the cotton industry in the first half of the 19th century was massive. Um, the, Britain was running trade surpluses up until, I'm not sure when the transition takes place, but, it, but I think it's round about the middle yeah, of the 19th century, you get the transition from trade surpluses to trade deficits, which then have to be financed and are financed out of the profits that are being generated by and large by India um, and other colonies, but certainly by and large by <coughs> India, of which the opium trade plays a critical role. But I think if you just sort of suggest that there's a, a continuous <coughs> role, a la Anderson, of you know, domination of the city, yeah, uh, you're in danger of underestimating the weight of, yeah, or the significance of the shift that comes with the Industrial Revolution and, and everything that unfolds from that. I think what's, re what's really fascinating, though, is that you, and something I would like to ask you now, is that as the city becomes bigger and more on a global stage, and Marx touches on this, but he never really touches on it in the journalism and so forth, the city in turn is also a transmitter of financial tensions elsewhere back into uh, the, the financial markets within London. So you've got a degree of globalisation of, of international financial markets taking place, but which, I, I, I mean, I, I think, you know, maybe I'll just ask you, really, I, I'll, I'll be very interested to see how you can lo locate the, the opium trade and all of that into that sort of picture. I'm not suggesting that Britain didn't industrialize. Obviously, it did. <laughs> it was the first industrial nation. I'm suggesting that British economic history is full of paradoxes. Okay, the first industrial nation is also a country where industrial capital is rigorously subordinated to commercial and financial capital. That's a paradox, and that's because economic power, however that is measured, doesn't translate directly into political power. All right. And this is the disjuncture that I, I'm not sure if Anderson means, is, this is what he means by the disjuncture, but this is the sense in which I understand the disjuncture, that you, know, you have manufacturing interests in Britain which are collectively not strong enough to be able to shape economic policy in this country. So that you have a, government, you have a state which is willing to trigger internal recessions in order to defend the pound, for example, which it's done repeatedly, not just in the 19th century, in the 20th century. All right. Um, so it's, it's, it's the only way of making sense of Thatcherism because, in a sense, Thatcherism was the most brutal expression of this kind of economic thinking. It was the culmination of a whole strand of conservative thinking, city-based conservative economic orthodoxy, the treasury view of the, of the economy, etc. It was the culmination of all that. But it coincided with a conjuncture in world economy when the merchant banks, the British merchant banks, were on the verge of extinction. The big change that takes place in the 60s is the realization that the fortunes of the city are not bound up with those of Stirling. So the Stirling city divorce is what ultimately allows the city paradoxically to recover primacy, international primacy, and, and then sort of prosper for the next uh, three or four decades. Stirling is no longer central uh, to, the, to the prosperity of British capitalism. Um, you know, it's up to Jamie. It's up to you to try and to try and um, work out the mechanisms in, in strictly kind of Marxist economic terms. 
um, what's going on. As, as the way I see it, it's, a, it's, it's part of the battle of competition between maybe large and small firms. Uh, you know, Marx himself says in volume three that a lot of the smaller capitalists are, are the ones who go into speculation and they lose. They lose massively. So it's, it's a process of redistribution of surplus value. So, I mean, in other words, obviously what you say is correct from the standpoint of social capital. But if you, if you look at, I mean, the reality of capitalism is always many capitals. It's always the vicious competition that's driving the accumulation process, okay? Um, there are massive transfers of surplus value occurring across the economy. Okay, I mean, quite apart from privatization and so on, the expansion of, uh, of space for private capital, etc., quite apart from that, quite apart from the attack on wages and living standards, there are other transfers of surplus value occurring uh, within the system. So I, I'm not suggesting that finance capital creates surplus value, but I think uh, a lot of the manufacturing companies were deeply implicated in the financial markets. We don't know that story yet. I mean, otherwise, why would Procter & Gamble be losing millions in derivatives trading as early as, early as 92 and 93? You know? I mean, what, isn't, what we don't know is how much it was actually making in years when it didn't lose. All right. That clearly goes, it's recycled back into the profitability of the firm in some way, isn't it? Um, so I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a fairly complex issue, and I don't, want, I don't wish to simplify it, but I think uh, you can't isolate manufacturing capital from finance capital in this way. The financial markets are drawing on, on, on sources from a wide range of institutional investors on the one hand, and also manufacturing firms on the other. I mean, a lot of them are, are in the derivatives sector by, by the 90s. Um, I mean, I don't, I, you know, your point about these, you know, these two counteracting tendencies that Grossman talks about, expansion into other markets, into, into, you know, kind of, um, sustains, sustains profitability insofar as it boosts um, the rate of profit worldwide, okay? Um, I mean, outsourcing is an obvious expression of this as well. It's an attempt to, to cut costs and sustain profitability in that way. Um, but the, the other mechanism that Grossman talks about, speculation on the exchanges, it seems to me must have something to do with stagnation in other sectors of the economy. It, what, it's what Marx calls latent money capital. Massive amounts of latent money capital are building up. Um, and partly through the institutional investor channel, and partly directly as well, that, you know, um, this, this idea about the institutional investors being, being ripped off by the finance capital. Um, I mean, the fund manager straddles these two different sorts of segments of the economy yeah. because the fund manager is at the interface between finance capital and the institutional investor. And, I mean, they clearly aren't, aren't doing well. <laughs> currently, currently, something like 60% of, of the money in the hedge fund industry comes from institutional investors, comes from the pension funds, for example. They're the biggest investors in, in hedge funds. Okay. Now, anyone would think, wow, that's, that's, isn't that dangerous? You know, you, on the one hand, you have staid pension funds. On the other hand, you have these incredibly uh, speculative hedge funds. But there's a, there's a complete combination, an alliance between them. I mean, the pension funds are under pressure to sustain yield or, or profitability, or whatever it is, to sustain revenues. And the hedge funds are the ones that are providing this. It's now called the alternative investment industry. It's no longer called hedge funds. The alternative investment industry. But they're the full guys, aren't they? Hmm? I mean, they're the full guys, and yeah. the pensioners are the, yeah. are the ultimate yeah. full guys and women. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Ben Snowwin, uh, thank you, Jarrett. Uh, fantastic talk, especially the bit I understood. Uh, I'm still trying to understand financialization. Um, I really, uh, I'd love you to write that up into a, a big a piece of itself. And that, this is my question here. I'd love in that piece if you engage with uh, questions raised by uh, world systems theory and how your approach, uh, what's distinctive about how you situate yourself in relation to uh, world system theory, because it seems uh, someone who's sympathetic to world system theory would say, well, Jairus here is showing how these large swathes of the colonial world are integrated into the circles of capital. They don't have capitalist social relations of uh, labour and capital, but they're nevertheless capitalists because they're producing profit for the world market. And he is therefore supporting a world system theory perspective. So I was just wondering how you would respond to that kind of uh, uh, question and how you position yourself to that kind of framework and uh, way of understanding uh, this uh, sucking in of the Indian economy into the world capitalist system. 
I think it's, it's just the way the, the accumulation of capital is structured. It's structured as an international process. It can't be, it can't be conceived or conceptualized or discussed in national terms. And that's been the case for you know, well over a century. I mean, Trotsky understood the point and he grasped its political implications uh, more than someone like Lenin did. I mean, because Trotsky saw capitalism in terms of world dynamics. <coughs> Um, and I think it's more true than ever today. And the one sector where, which demonstrates the integration of capital in this sense is, of course, the, is, is, is the financial sector, which is globally deeply, deeply integrated. And uh, I mean, Lehman Brothers, for example, at the time of its downfall in September 2008, had one million derivatives contracts going. Okay, one million. That's one investment firm on Wall Street has a million derivatives contracts. Imagine the, the counterparties that those, that those parties in turn are, are linked into. I mean, it's phenomenal. The integration of world economy at the financial level is just, it's, it's an unknowable quantity, which is why this whole rhetoric about too big to fail and too integrated to fail and so on has come up. It's an unknowable quantity. And if you read these kind of personal accounts of the crisis, like Paulson's written On the Brink and um, Sorokin has written this book about the, the way the you know, the financial system was salvaged by, by uh, Paulson and uh, Bernanke and so on. You know, you read the kind of blow-by-blow blow account of what was happening week by week. This is the level at which they actually understood the whole thing. They just had no clue what was really happening. They had no clue how to manage the crisis. Um, and the big unknown, the unknowable quantity is the actual degree of integration within the financial system. I mean... <coughs> It's, it strands the entire world, and you have, you know, God knows, municipalities in Italy, you have regional governments in China, all locked into this one massive, I mean, one, some of the biggest holders of subprime were, were Chinese investors, you know, and they lost, they lost massively. Um, I don't see the need to bring a, a model like that, world systems theory, into, into an understanding of what's the dynamics of, uh, of world capitalism, which is accumulation is always structured as an international process. And uh, we need to, we need to sort of explore that much more and, and build different sorts of models of it because I mean I've only suggested one possible model that's the colonial trades and, and, and the way it worked with risk but that was still ultimately as Alex is suggesting formal subsumption of labour because those very same peasants could just opt out of the whole circuit they could switch to other crops or etc you know so it's it's not as if um, it's not a stable system it's an unstable system. <coughs> I actually wanted to ask you about how uh, indigenous circuits of money gap, which were actually quite robust uh, through the period that you're talking about, and had an um, ambiguous relationship with these other larger circuits of capital sure. that you're talking about, sometimes coinciding, sometimes not coinciding in terms of rates of yeah. profit and rates of return and so on. How do you kind of build that into uh, the system? Yeah, I mean, that's for a, a different sort of discussion, but ba basically um, <coughs> a lot of the agency houses in India worked with uh, resources that were raised domestically. So for example, large Hindu banking houses uh, lost in the Indigo crash, they lost uh, millions in the Indigo crash of 1829 and 30, because they were the ones who were actually you know, the creditors to the agency houses. Uh, and then the whole money market froze up. You know, they refused to lend after that. And relations were extremely strained because they didn't trust the agency houses anymore. So, you know, indigenous merchant capital has always been a major source of much of the money capital that circulates. I mean, it's, it's always if... Um, the key question would be, yeah. does it coincide entirely or does it... Uh, or, or does it... Is it like a fade thread that you kind of have to stick off partly when it's going to See, in, in, in the case of opium, it's basically, it's money which is kept in the treasury. The treasury is part of a large go-down, all right? And these disbursements which are made in September, the opium advances, they come from those local treasuries, okay? It's government money, okay, which is being, which is being disbursed. But a lot, I mean, Marx's journalistic writings already show an awareness of some of these interlinkages between indigenous merchants on the one hand, and, and the East India Company, uh, and the commercial houses, etc. He is already aware of these connections. Um, <coughs> yeah, I mean, it all interlocks in, in, in a way that you can't sort of 
think about it separately in a, any longer. I mean, just two points about that. One is that um, <coughs> the what the manufacturers, what Manchester was worried about at the time of the Opium Wars and why they were part of the war lobby was the impact that any shutting down of the opium trade would have on India and the demand for these goods from, from, from Britain. Therefore, you know, demand for textile products from Britain. They, what they were worried about was the effect it would have on the Indian market. Okay. It's true that they would have liked to see a phenomenal expansion of their, of their markets through the unopening up of China. I, I think they didn't seriously expect that to come about. Okay. It, the, the, the interest driving the, the, the opium wars and so on was largely commercial interests. Um, the second qualification is that if you look at the origins of industrial capitalism in India, um, with the exception of uh, the, West, the West, Western India, uh, the textile industry and indigenous capitalists and so on, by and large that emerges from commercial capital. Okay, it's the agency houses who transform themselves into conglomerate business groups. Okay, so I mean I refer to James Finlay. What was Finlay into? I mean Finlay was into things like coal and jute and tea and so on and so forth. So industrial capital in the eastern part of the country emerges from these agency houses as they begin to um, you know move into manufacturing and in an in industrial enterprise and so on. So as for I mean, you know, Marx um, clearly assumes that as industrial capital emerges in Britain, it's somehow going to be politically dominant. He just assumes that political dominance. Um, and it doesn't come about. It's, I mean, it's clear that the British establishment that's constructed is, is not an establishment founded on the interests of industrial capital, um, but largely on, on, on the interests of the city and the foreign <coughs> office, insofar as the foreign office represents some kind of independent interest in all this. Uh, yeah, I subscribe to the Anderson thesis in, in, in the <coughs> David Fishman, one point is that the last year that Britain ran a visible trade surplus was 1821. You spent in deficits. On the point of the death of the British merchant banking system, the death knell was Big Bang, which was, of course, under the Tories in, I think, 86 or 87. <coughs> Further point, do you have any insight as to why the Bush administration forced Lehman's to go bankrupt, which clearly had a very great magnifying effect on the crisis? And lastly, the, you talk about the difficulty of getting uh, a handle, getting of measuring the liabilities and assets of the financial system because it's also interlocking. But if you consolidate, aggregate, and net out, you can come up with clarity. Now this comes back to your point as to the, comp the fierce competition between companies, which I agree with at the individual level. But it's not the individual company 
the particular company A or B that matters. It's the capital in, as a whole, the industry as a whole, the market as a whole. And Marx clearly demonstrated uh, building from the classical economists, the physicrats, really looking at the system-wide view, which shouldn't be the national economy, it has to be the global economy, as appropriate. We're looking at the oil upstream industry, it's the total world picture that we have to look at. If we're looking at local shopping, obviously we look at a different level. But in the end, we can resolve industries and markets by <coughs> aggregating all the participants, the companies, in them to come up with a single aggregate picture which then is much more powerful to analyze. <coughs> <laughs> um, just a very quick thing on the uh, allowing lemurs to go bankrupt. I think there are two factors. It's difficult to know what weight to give to each of them. But one of them was that the management of lemurs just pissed off the American government. Um, but the main one, I think, is that they're running out of money. The same weekend they decided to let lemurs go was the same weekend they had to rescue AIG. They tried over that weekend to sell lemurs to the British, to Barclays Bank. The Brits smelt a rat. If it was such a good deal, why were they giving it to us? And um, basically, by Monday, uh, Barclays bought a bit of layman's it wanted to for about 12 and a half p. So uh, essentially, they they didn't really know necessarily the full consequences of what would happen, but they basically were in a hole themselves. A complete crisis, and they were running out of options. Well, um, something that won't necessarily be so obvious from, from, from the thing, I mean, which is that the analogies, the possible analogies between opium and the financial markets, okay, are, are numerous because traders, I, I, you know, I, I made this point about it's, it's the fixed income traders who begin to revolutionize Wall Street in the 1980s, yeah? Those traders are huge gamblers. I mean, not just in the firms they, they work for, and during the working day, so to speak. But in the evenings, they fly off to Atlantic City and, you know, they, they, they gamble. So, and gambling is an obsession. It's an absolute obsession. You read Partnoy's brilliant book, Fiasco. It's also linked to very high levels of aggression within the industry and within society as a whole. So America, in a sense, is a, is a strange... It's like these communicating vessels. War is one of the vessels communicating with finance, on the other hand. You know, phenomenal levels of aggression in both. Um, and I don't know where gun culture fits into all this. But, <laughs> but, but, you know, Partnoy's book really brings this out so well. The sort of, you know, relaxation. Your weekend relaxation involves duck shooting, you know, kind of, it's, it's an expedition, you wear, you wear military uniforms and you go out and, you know, you shoot as many ducks as you can and you come back to work on Monday and then you lose another million or... <laughs> so, what I'm trying to suggest, and I'm not in the least suggesting that, that capitalism is driven by all this, but I think um, you can't just see the individual capitalist as a personification of capital in some abstract, anonymous sense, you know. I mean, there are instincts which are at work within the markets, which are the reality of capital. You know, for Marx, the, of competition, this book that he never wrote, the treatise on competition, which he never got around to, to writing, would have dealt to a large extent with the way capitalists deal with each other uh, and the kind of uh, ferocity that's displayed uh, at the level of many capitals. Um, but, you know... Gambling is an addiction, speculation kind of based on gambling, gambling is an addiction, so, you know, I mean, I, I, I want to suggest that the analogies operate at different levels between, you know, it's not just, I mean, initially I, I wanted to try and develop an argument in a more, in a more complex way, I decided um, not to do that because it would sort of drive things in a different direction, but um, there is no learning process in finance capital, unlike manufacturing, <laughs> unlike manufacturing, where there is a learning process, Okay, there is no learning process in, in finance. It's largely driven by speculation, and speculation can be incredibly addictive. You know. Okay. Um, before we show our
because I have important announcements. Uh, first, a follow-up on the Marikana support campaign. Um, we made a good start collecting 